Okay, and welcome to this continuing series of lectures in my online Introduction to Philosophy course. Uh, we're now entering the phase of the course where we'll be talking about the empiricists. So we've been spending a lot of time on Descartes and so forth and various rationalist thinkers. Now we're going to look at what are typically known as the classical British empiricists. Um, we'll start with John Locke, although people uh, sometimes grumble because Hobbes, um, who came earlier, is somewhat of a better philosopher, a better writer, a better thinker. Um, but Locke has earned a place, and a lot of people cite him as the first modern empiricist. Um, we'll talk about Locke, we'll talk about Berkeley, um, and David Hume, who's Scottish but gets br grouped in with the British empiricists. So this lecture will be focusing particularly on Locke and Berkeley, and then we'll have a separate set of lectures on David Hume. All right, so just to remind ourselves where we are here, this is the timeline we've been following in this course, and um, we started all the way back where we sort of looked at the invention of writing, worked our way to the ancient period, um, the beginning of Western philosophy. We fast forwarded to the modern period. We were looking at Descartes, who writes his major work in 1641. Um, and just to remind you, Newton is writing his um, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy in 1687. Um, and the period we're going to be looking at now is John Locke writes his most famous work, An Essay Concerning Human Understanding, in 1690. So that's just three years after Newton publishes the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Um, then we'll turn our attention to Berkeley, who writes one of his most famous pieces, A Treatise Concerning the Principles of Human Knowledge, in 1710. So we're, um, remember, Descartes was 1641, so now we're coming into the 1700s, and eventually we're going to be getting to Hume, who's writing in 1748, and Hume actually dies in the year of the American Revolution, 1776. Okay, um, and then of course we're going to be ending this discussion of the modern period by looking at Kant, who's writing in the 1780s. So a lot of the people that we're be, we'll be discussing are alive at the end of the 1600s, the beginning of the 1700s. This is when modern science, as we pretty much know it, um, as common sense knows it at least, is being developed, purified, and refined. And of course it all culminates in... Um, the work of Newton, the mathematical physics. Okay, so we're going to start with Locke here, first of all. Now, Locke can, in some sense, be seen as trying to naturalize Descartes. So Descartes had been a champion of mechanistic philosophy, you'll recall from the last lecture, uh, which is the claim that the physical world is a giant mechanism. The dominant metaphor in the 1600s would have been something like a giant clock, uh, so Descartes' work, along with Galileo, laid the foundation for Newton's work, and it's pretty clear that Newton had read Descartes' work and um, extended and revised some of his ideas and mathematized it and developed calculus as a solution to various problems, um, which allowed that kind of mathematically precise physics to develop. So the kind of physics we associate with equations um, differential equations describing the movement of objects and so on. This is what's being developed. And Locke is around at the time of this development. He's very impressed by what's going on there. Uh, but he's an empiricist. He doesn't think that, um, like Descartes, that there are truths which can be known only by reason, and that the way you start is by first trying to figure out what can be knowable with certainty, and then extending that to give you a theory of the physical world. So he's, he can, Locke can be seen as holding much the same views as Descartes about the mind, uh, with some exceptions, um, except some major disagreements about the nature and source of innate ideas. So whether there are any at all, uh, we'll see that Locke is going to argue that there are not. And the way we come to achieve knowledge, not by reason, but by careful experimentation, careful observation. Uh, that's the way Newton extracted out his laws of motion, was by looking at a lot of data that Galileo had left of how physical objects behave, accelerating at, um, at various uh, 
inclines and so forth, and then extracting out of that empirical observations a mathematical description. So there's the idea that it's looking at the world, with, which in the first and foremost uh, instance gives us real knowledge about the world. Okay, so as I had just had previously mentioned, Locke starts off in his famous work by trying to attack uh, innate ideas. He doesn't think that there are any innate ideas. So Descartes had argued that all clear and distinct ideas are innate and that these things are necessarily true and known directly by reason. So the first foremost idea is I think therefore I am and then you have various mathematical concepts, logical concepts, physics and so forth which are also innate. So Locke develops two arguments against innate ideas. The first is that not every person agrees or has these ideas. And the second is uh, the crux of his argument is that there's an alternative explanation because in every case we can give a story which shows how the idea arose from experience. So that's what we're going to briefly look at um, is Locke's attempt to do this. Okay, so the first argument. Well, if there were innate ideas, if there really were innate ideas, then there would be universal agreement about these things. So, for instance, here's something which was thought to be innate, that a thing cannot be and also not be at the same time. So something can't exist and also not exist at the very same time. Now you might think, yeah, there is universal agreement on that, right? Everybody agrees that something can not both exist and cease to exist, but it turns out that there isn't. And at the very least, there are, you can find people who will deny these kinds of claims, whether they're um, from different societies, whether they're in mental institutions or whatnot, there is not universal agreement on this. And Locke cites this as a flaw in the idea that there are innate ideas. So the, the, the crux of this argument, the real force of it, comes from something that Locke shares with Descartes, which is the claim that one is immediately and infallibly aware of the contents of one's own mind. Of one's own mind. So Locke and Descartes both held that if something happened in your mind, then you must be aware of it. So it's inconceivable on their view that there could be something going on in your mind which you don't know about. So the mind is something which you have immediate, unfailing access to. And if that's your view, then anything in there should be immediately apprehended by the conscious subject. So if there are these ideas in there, then they should be apprehended by these subjects and they shouldn't disagree. But yet we do find disagreement. So uh, now you might say, yeah, but they're crazy or yeah, but they, there's something different about them. But Locke thinks that this is besides the point. So we may say that they're crazy. They think we're crazy. So which of us, who, who's the really say ultimately um, who's correct here, right? The fact of the matter is that there are not, there is not universal agreement on the existence of these facts. Now continuing, um, uh, continuing this, Locke develops another line of this kind of argument where he says, look, if there were innate ideas, then they would have to be there at birth, right? They're born in there. So even infants would have to be aware of them from this other, from the conjunction of these two claims. So you, um, you, you have a mind which has certain contents. You have the view that the subject has unfailing access to those contents. And so you put those together. If babies have minds and their minds are filled with these things, they should immediately come out knowing math and geometry and physics, logic and so forth. But that's not what happens at all. So Locke's main case here is what he calls infants and idiots, and idiot is an older term for a mentally deficient person. So the case here is that infants and idiots don't have these ideas, but if they're supposed to be born in at e in each person's mind universally, this seems to refute that claim. Like notice, it's also um, an empirical argument that uh, Locke is making here. We have empirical evidence that it's just not the case that there's universal agreement uh, about these things, and uh, so therefore we should re reject this idea. Now, 
After Locke, there came to be a view which was developed by Leibniz, which is uh, a different way of thinking about innate ideas. So what Leibniz did was to contend that the, the knowledge isn't in there already when you're born, but rather there's some kind of capacity or disposition to acquire it, which comes online at a various, at, at some stage in development. So that um, when you're born, you may not know Two, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a necessary truth, but as you develop, there's a faculty in the mind which comes online and gives you access to that necessary piece of knowledge. And this is a way of responding to Locke's claim that infants and idiots don't have this stuff because now you can say, well, something went developmentally wrong with the idiot case and the babies haven't developed it yet, so if we allow them this kind of time, um, it will eventually develop. Now, of course, the argument over whether these ideas are innate is besides the point. And one problem with this whole debate at that time was that the issue of innateness kind of is a red herring. Because what Locke really wants to assert is that all knowledge comes from experience. So if it does turn out that some aspects of human reasoning are innate, there is still the question of whether that innate knowledge could have risen in response to experience. So, for instance, if you take an evolutionary view, you might think that, yeah, there's certain things that are built in there. Uh, they're built in there by evolution over a long period of time, uh, but they're in response to the experience of ancestors. And so ultimately are the kinds of things which experience taught us. And if that's your view, then you can sort of say, agree that there are innate ideas and then go on to wonder whether or not those innate ideas give us access to any necessary and universal features about reality. So it's sort of a, a, a unfortunate aspect of this debate that they got hung up talking about whether they were innate or not and not about um, what the true source of those ideas were. Now, of course, there's an assumption behind all this that if they're, if the ideas are innate, then the source must be somehow direct insight or something like that. So, so it's a bit forgivable that they phrased it in this way. But this leads us to our next issue here, which is that Locke wants to try to show that we can account for all human knowledge solely on the basis of our experience. So on the one hand, he has this idea that you can say not everyone shares feeling the same way about these ideas so that we have some evidence that they aren't innate. And also we can give a positive account which shows how everything which you think we know can ultimately be built up out of things we have experienced. So this includes everything. Mathematics, logic, language, physics, biology, literature, psychology, everything, right? So the goal that Locke has is to try to show how all of this stuff is ultimately traceable back to something in our experience. Now, to begin this, um, he first makes a, a simple distinction, which isn't as clear in Locke as it is in later empiricists, but Locke does endorse a, a, a version of this. And this is the idea of a distinction between a simple and a complex idea. So simple ideas are ones that don't have any constituent parts and come directly from experience. So a simple idea might be like a shape or a color or a sound. Um, so it's something we pick up immediately from our experience. Whereas a complex idea is composed of a simple idea. So once you have these two kinds of ideas, it's easy to explain a whole wide swath of things that we normally think about. So for instance, if I want to think about a unicorn, even though there are no unicorns, I've never experienced a unicorn, I can show how my idea of a unicorn is really a complex idea, which is composed of simpler ones. Like for instance, the idea of a horse plus the idea of an animal with a horn. You combine those two things and you get the idea of a unicorn. And of course, I've had experience with horses and also with unicorns, uh, excuse me, not with unicorns. I've also had experience with animals with horns. So each part of that idea is composed of simpler things, which I actually have had experience with. And then I'm able to combine those two things together in the mind to form a complex idea. And of course, even the idea of a horse is composed of simpler ideas of various shapes and colors and sounds and so forth. So ultimately what Locke thinks is that there's going to be a small set 
of basic ideas, of primitive ones that we get directly from interacting with our experience. And then those things can be recombined in such a way as to allow us to form ever more complex ideas. So that's an important tool and one that gets made of a lot of use of is put, excuse me, that's an important tool and, and one that gets used a lot in constructing empiricist theories. Okay, so now simple ideas have as their source one or two, excuse me, simple ideas have one of two sources. So some of our simple ideas come from sensation, which just means the ideas about uh, that we have of external objects. So for instance, tables, chairs, colors, qualities like hot and cold, sweet, the planets, all of those things we get from actually sensing. So uh, we hear, we see, we taste, we touch, we smell, and etc. Then of course, we're also able to reflect on our own mental activity. And reflection is the source of our idea of our own mental life. So for instance, um, when I want to do something, when I doubt it, when I perceive something, like I hear it, um, how do I have the concept of hearing something? Well, I'm able to reflect on my own experience and the various auditory experiences I have give rise to the concept of perceiving. So all of this stuff um, is then at our disposal and are the primitive things out of which we're going to build our more complex ideas. And reflection, the mind's ability to self-reflect, to reflect on its own activities, is going to become an important part of Locke's theory. Okay, so let's go ahead and remind ourselves. Uh, Locke basically accepts Descartes' view about perception. Remember, he is can be seen as trying to naturalize the theory that Descartes had, trying to take away the rationalism and innate ideas, make it uh, an empiricist kind of view. So there's a physical world that, and a body, and those causally interact, and that gives rise to our experience. And notice that the colors, sounds, and shapes are in the mind of the person, not out there in the world. And this is uh, what's usually called Locke's causal theory of perception. And Descartes held a causal theory of perception as well. Um, Locke gives fancy names to these, which have stuck. So secondary qualities are what Locke calls sound, shape, excuse me, Secondary qualities refer to such things as sound, color, taste, feelings of warmth, and etc. These things are not really out there in the world. So when you look at an object and see its color, there's no real color on the object, according to Locke. The color is in the mind. Um, now, the primary qualities of an object uh, amount to the kinds of properties an object has, which can be quantified or mathematized. So you can say how much mass, how much density, how much weight, um, how fast something is moving. These things really are in the objects. Um, and we know that they're there because we have mathematical physics, which tells us about how they behave and the way that they work. So Locke is accepting Descartes' view that there are the properties in the mind, secondary qualities, and then there are the properties outside of the mind, um, the primary qualities. And the only ones which are really out there that are mind-independent are the primary qualities. So uh, this is something that is a theme through all of the work in this modern period. Uh, it's really thought that modern science, the science of Newton and Galileo, had demonstrated that colors were merely in the mind of the perceiver and did not exist in the actual physical world so that if you were to remove all human minds you would be left with a world that only had the mathematically quantifiable properties shape size weight and etc so this is just a way in which Locke is similar very similar to Descartes so here's a way of just spelling out what we just said um, the primary properties are mind independent um, they're all the properties which a mathematical physics appeals to, and the secondary properties are produced in the mind. They are, the, the objects out there, lock things, have a tendency to produce in us this kind of experience. So, for instance, when we call something red, and we're talking about a physical object, the physical property of red for lock is simply whatever property an object has which disposes us 
to have a red kind of experience. But the red experience is not something which is in the world. No object really looks red. Um, the red experience is merely something that is mental. Now, Locke's views on the self are also very interesting and have become very persuasive um, and uh, in modern contemporary times. So Locke's question, which is really motivated by his Christianity, um, he wants to know when you, if you really believe in the resurrection and you become resurrected, what counts it? What makes that resurrected person the same person as you? Right. That's Locke's question. So this amounts to a claim, a question about what did it means to say that a person is the same person over time. So, I mean, just to give you a general feel about this, I feel like I'm the same person I was today as when I was young, uh, but why? And notice, this isn't to say I believe everything that I did when I was young. I, of course, have many different beliefs. I have, I've learned a lot of stuff. I've rejected some of my old beliefs, modified others. Um, I still have some of them, etc. But uh, nonetheless, when I look at a picture of me from when I was five years old, holding up a toy, for instance, I can say, look, that's me holding that toy. And the question here is, in virtue of what am I right? In virtue of what is it that that thing, the picture really is a picture of me, even though I'm physically very different um, in it, in, than that thing in the picture. So there are many answers to this question. Locke gives one very famous answer, which is that you are the same person because you remember yourself or are conscious of yourself as being the same person that has existed over time. So this is what's known as psychological continuity. You are aware of yourself as a person who has these various experiences. You remember that happening to you. You're conscious of this time period in between then and now. So in short, you are aware of your mental life as belonging to a single self. And Locke's answer to the question, what makes a person the same, is just this. If you have this kind of psychological continuity, then you are the same person. If not, then you are not. So a fun way to get a, a fun way to kind of test this and see what you feel about this kind of stuff is to think about this following kind of thought experiment. So suppose that a new technology is invented that allows us to teleport to faraway places. Uh, and it doesn't have to be far away, of course. Let's just say you can teleport to work. Um, it's a snowstorm out and you'd rather not drive. Or if you like it more far-fetched and fanciful, you could teleport to the moon or to Mars or whatever, um, where there's tourist technology, uh, te tourist industries have started up. So suppose that the technology works this way. You step into a machine and it scans your genetic makeup. Now what it does is it uses this very exact genetic information to create a duplicate of you on the other end where the other teleporter is located. So you don't actually move to the other location. Rather they scan you they take that information and use it to make an exact duplicate. So the duplicate over there is flesh and blood um, and so forth. Now, unfortunately, in order to do this, they have to destroy the original body. But the copy on the other side is exactly the same. It has all of the same memories, thoughts, feelings, emotions, beliefs, desires, and etc. In fact, you could imagine this as occurring very quickly, and maybe you were in the process of saying something, like maybe you're during the course of teleporting, uttering the sentence, I can't believe I'm going to Mars, and maybe your physical body was destroyed on Earth when you uttered the phrase, I can't believe and then as the duplicate is created on Mars, it would continue, I'm going to Mars. So from the point of view of the duplicate, nothing has happened except now that they're on Mars, right? You have all the same thoughts, all the same beliefs, all the same feelings, all the same emotions. Uh, from, from the point of view of that person, uh, well, all you did, you step in, you remember stepping into the teleporter on Earth, and you remember thinking to yourself, I can't believe I'm going to Mars, and you started saying that, and the next thing you know, you're on Mars. So now, of course, Locke would say you're the same person. All that, right? All that matters is that you have this kind of psychological continuity, and this duplicate on Mars does have that psychological continuity. Um, now, the question here, the test for you, is would you use this technology or not? 
And this isn't a way to try to figure out whether the view is right. This is just a way for you to figure out what you think about Locke's view. Because Locke's view is there's no reason you shouldn't use the technology. Having the same body isn't what's important. What's important is you have the same psychological continuity, the same stream of consciousness, the same memories, beliefs, desires that you did a second ago, and that you're aware of yourself as having that same series. Um, in fact, Locke uses lots of examples like this. You know, he says, look, we can imagine um, switching consciousnesses, what, uh, what he calls the prince and the pauper. So you can imagine a, a prince having his consciousness switched with a poor person. And of course, we're very familiar with this view from popular movies, like for instance, Big with Tom Hanks, where his um, consciousness is switched into a, a grown-up's body and Freaky Friday and so forth and so on. So there's tons of examples of, of these kinds of ideas that Locke has. And his idea, look, it's not the same body that makes you you. You switch consciousness. Your, your consciousness is now in Lindsay Lohan's body. And it's still you that's in Lindsay Lohan's body. So it's still you that's in there. Um, it doesn't matter which body you have. It doesn't matter how the uh, what brain it is, what what immortal soul is connected to it, if there are any. What matters is this psychological continuity. Okay, so that's been a very influential view in the philosophy of personal identity. Now let's turn quickly to talking about Berkeley and Berkeley in particular in regards to idealism. So, Berkeley is an idealist, and an idealist is someone who denies that matter exists. So, Berkeley thinks that the only things which exist are mental things, that everything is an experience. And Berkeley is an empiricist, and he thinks empiricism is the driving reason for why we should believe that idealism is true. That's because by material, by matter, what he means is the mind-independent stuff posited by Descartes and also by Locke, which we cannot perceive. It's the substance which underlies the primary quality. So remember the primary-secondary quality distinction that we just talked about. Um, so the primary qualities are in the first instance mental as well. It's just that they resemble or reflect the real properties that objects have. So when you're looking at a table and seeing the shape of it, the color of the table is just in the mind. It doesn't accurately capture the way the table is, but the shape of it does, Locke says. The shape of your idea, your experience of the table, resembles the actual table out there in the world um, which you are in contact with. And Barclay is here going to try to attack the idea that there's some stuff outside of our experience which the experiences are trying to capture. So the first reason is just this thing that we've been talking about. We're all empiricists here, and we've never seen any material, so why should we believe that it's there? Empiricism is the view that what is real is what you can see, taste, touch, smell, and hear. And according to empiricism, at least in this modern version we're looking at, the only things that you see, taste, touch, and hear are experiences. So empiricists should just accept the idea that everything that they observe in their day-to-day -day lives is a mental thing and isn't really a material thing in the sense that Locke and Berkeley wanted us to think. Now, the other line of argument that Berkeley develops is that the primary qualities of our experiences are said to resemble the materials they represent. And Berkeley spends a lot of time trying to figure out what that could mean. How could something mental resemble something physical? Mental, mental things and physical things are so very different, it doesn't seem to be any way that we can coherently tell a story about how one could resemble the other. So if we take that seriously, then we have no real way of saying primary qualities resemble the material things that exist in the world. Berkeley at some point says the very concept of this material that these philosophers are talking about is incomprehensible. 
Uh, this is what's sometimes known as Barclay's master argument, and it's got less attention recently than it used to, and people have moved away from thinking that Barclay really is hanging as much as he is on, uh, as, as he was thought to on this idea. But the idea was supposed to be that you can't even conceive of what it would mean for matter to be existing when you aren't looking at it independently of you experiencing it. And the idea was supposed to be that every time you try to conceive or imagine some object existing mind independently, say you're trying to think of a tree that's um, in the middle of a forest with no one around to see it. Well, Barclay says as soon as you try to do that, you have now thought of the object. It's now you, you're picturing it in your mind. And so you can't really even picture what it would mean to say that the tree exists all by itself. Uh, that's an idea um, which Bar some, which scholars have called Barclay's master argument. All right, so I said that already. Now, so let's just get our picture back up here again and just repeat the same things that we've been saying here so far. So Locke's theory had this distinction between primary and, sensor and secondary qualities, um, and these are both properties of your experience. Uh, I have primary qualities out there just to indicate that they, those things are real properties of objects. Um, and they are supposed to be the, the things which resemble the shapes and so on of the ideas we have. So when we're having our experience of the tree, the color of its leaves and bark are purely mental and don't accurately capture the way the tree is. The tree is not colored in any way. But see how the shape of the tree there is the same as the shape of the tree outside. So we make this inference that outside of us, there's something which is causally responsible for our perception of the tree. And that thing is something which has the, the actual primary qualities that we experience in our experience. So in one way, you can see Barclay as simply pressing the empiricists on this distinction. So they've already given up the idea that the secondary qualities, those properties of our experience, accurately represent the way the world is. Right? The, the empiricists have already accepted that at this point. So why should we think that the primary qualities of our experience also accurately capture the world out there? Once you're prepared to say the colors aren't out there, what makes you think the shapes are? What makes you think all of these other things are? Um, we can't ever see those objects. That was something which Barclay um, is very keen on pressing Locke and his predecessors like Descartes. They both, Locke and Descartes admit that we don't have access to these objects. What we have are representations of them. And so we can't ever really 100% verify that the objects are out there, except but through the work of God, um, who guarantees that we're not deceived. And so that that's the only way that we can get around this idea. So why don't we just give it up? How can we be so sure if we're really empiricists and we're accepting only this idea that the th things exist are those things which we can see, why not just get rid of the mysterious things that we never actually come into contact with in our experience? So one way of thinking about idealism is by using an analogy from the digital age. So consider the things you see in a video game. So suppose you're playing The Sims. Or suppose you're playing, you know, some um, multi-online game, massively multiplayer online game, um, like uh, Second Life or, you know, uh, uh, World of Warcraft or anything, right? So suppose you're in the game and you walk into a room and you see a table in the room, right? So there you go into the room, you see a table. Now, if you leave the room and go back into it, the same table is there. If you set down something in that room and leave and then walk back into that room, the same thing is still in the same place on the table. So now, of course, when you are not in the room, when, when you're not there, there's no table still existing there. What there is is a bit of code somewhere which says if the player does this and that and the other thing, then represent this on the screen. So the table only exists when it's perceived or when you're in the room with it, when you're, um, if you're in a first person kind of game, when your gaze is focused on it, when you turn to the left, the things there just simply aren't there anymore. Uh, so this is what 
Barclay means when he says in Latin, S-A-S percipe, which means the essence of things is to be perceived. So in order to exist, Barclay thought, an object had to be perceived. So what does this mean? So you leave the room and the table, no one's in there looking at the table. Does that mean that the table doesn't exist? Well, strictly speaking, if no one is really looking at the table, then Barclay says that's right. The table doesn't exist. It only exists when someone is looking at it. But, Barclay claims, God is always perceiving the physical world, and so therefore we can rest assured that the physical world is always existing. It exists because God is there in order to perceive it. And this was, Barclay thought, a nice and clever way to try to argue for God's existence. We need an eternal observer in order to verify are the fundamental nature of the physical world. So now, before I end here, I just want to say that Barclay's views are very anti-common sense, the idea that the physical world doesn't exist and that all that exists are mental things, experiences. But in order to refute Barclay, it's not simply enough to say, well, look, the table is over there. I can touch it. Remember, we've been over this. Everybody agrees that the experiences you have in a dream or in some matrix-like scenario aren't enough to really prove that there are tables in the room. So you can't simply say, look, Barclay, here's a table. Don't you see it? Barclay will say, yes, of course I do. But what I see is an experience. What I'm hearing, what I feel, all those things are in the mind already. Everybody already agrees that uh, this is the case. And this is generally because of the dreaming kind of stuff we've been talking about. So this is sometimes what's called the argument from dreaming or hallucination. In the dream, I see a table. It looks just the same as the awaking, uh, the table I see when I'm awake. There is no table in the dream. I'm only having an experience. So when I see the table when I'm awake, since they look exactly the same, what I see when I'm awake must merely be an experience as well. Everybody has accepted that view already. And so Barclay is simply saying, look, it's the other side. It's the empiricists who think that there is more to the world than what we can experience who are violating their concerns with common sense. If your view is that the only things which exist are those things which I can see, taste, touch, smell, and hear, and you also think that you can never see, taste, touch, or hear matter, then you shouldn't think that matter exists. And that's Barclay's point. The empiricists have no reason to believe in matter as the philosophers defined it, in other words, as being that stuff which the primary qualities are thought to in be in and which we never come across in our experience. All we ever have are these properties which the objects are represented as having, and we never actually get to see the actual material stuff out there. So Barclay's challenge is, if you're going to be an empiricist, explain why you get to believe in things that you've never seen before. And when it's put that way, it's targeted at a very specific form of empiricism which was developed at this time, and to which there's no good answer, at least not yet. And it's important that we understand this way of putting it, because it's this way of thinking about things that Locke is, uh, I mean, excuse me, that Kant is going to come along and try to challenge.